morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Glad. Uh, before we get started here, let me tell you a couple of things. Uh, Tuesday night is uh, neighbor night. Uh, so you know, national night out. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. Whatever's going on in your neighborhood, be a part of it and uh, keep building friendships. Practice the art of neighboring because God's called us not only to love God, but to love people. And you want to be a part of that. So I encourage you to do that. Also, do me a favor. Pray for me this week. I, I'm going to spend a week in Romania and have the opportunity to speak to about 200 pastors uh, uh, from one denomination in that country who are kind of looking uh, to uh, kind of a new direction. Uh, in the country and kind of uh, are looking for uh, insight in terms of like, how do we go about reaching people in this country? So we're going to have the opportunity to speak. And I'm really glad about that. Matt Kennedy's going with me. So that's a real reason for prayer right there is, is I've got Kennedy with me. So that that's a, heightens the, you know, the intensity of that. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Father, we, we're looking forward now to our time together in your word. And as uh, Isaiah prayed, uh, Holy Spirit, we, we look to you for giving us understanding and insight, but especially, uh, Holy Spirit, we, we pray that you would give us courage and give us faith to fully embrace and apply the truth that you uh, explained to us today. And so, Lord, as your family, we tell you that we love you, that we respond uh, today in praise to your great love for us, and that, Lord, even as we open up your word, we would continue in that way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So imagine you are a uh, reporter for ESPN, and they send you down to Dallas, Texas to interview some, you know, some fans there on the city. And so, you know, you're, you're there, and, and you're on the city there in Dallas, and you approach a guy and you say, so are you, uh, you know, you a Cowboys fan? And uh, he says, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, oh man, yeah, I'm, I'm a Cowboys fan. And he says, not, you know, Dallas Cowboys, not, not, not Oklahoma State Cowboys, that's you know, he would want to make that distinction. And, uh, you know, I really thought I would get a better reaction than that. You know, the Oklahoma State Cowboys. Okay, you know, yeah, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. In fact, he says, oh man, I esteem the Cowboys. I esteem the Cowboys above all. And you say, really? Well, so you must go to all the games. Oh no. <laughs> Are you kidding? Like, that is so expensive. Like, you get there, they're looking for money for the parking, money for, you know, any little drink. It's amazing how much money is involved. Man, it costs so much. No, I don't go to the games. Oh, well, well certainly you watch every game then, you know, steaming the Cowboys. About, well, yeah, you know, unless there's something, you know, sometimes there's something better on, uh, you know, like, you know, one of these house, housekeeping shows or something. Oh, really? Okay, well, um, my, you, you, you probably, being the, you're such a big Cowboys fan, you probably really keep up with all the stats and, you know, you, you, you read all the interviews and, you know, you, you keep up with the schedule and, and you're reading anything that you can about the Cowboys. Well, no, um, to tell you the truth, when I read that kind of stuff, it's just really boring. I just, I just find it hard to really get much out of that. So, no, I don't, I don't really do that. Oh. Well, you're probably, you know, being a big Cowboys fan, you're probably really elated or really depressed at times, you know, emotionally married to how they're doing, right? Win, loss, and, and you're just, emo no, uh, you know, Cowboys have always been around. They'll always be here. Are you telling that, like, do you kind of jump up and get engaged and, like, shout at the TV and yell and cheer? Like, are you, are you really do that? Well, you know, not so much. You know, by 3 o'clock, those 3 o'clock games, I'm usually like napping by the second quarter. Now, about that time in the interview, you might actually question <laughs> how big of a fan this guy is of the Cowboys. Like, how, you know, what is the meaning of esteeming if you say you esteem the Cowboys above all? In fact, uh, you know, John Piper kind of uh, makes comment. He says, you know, we have a name for those who try to praise uh, someone that they take no pleasure in. Uh, we call them hypocrites. You might say, well, that Cowboys fan, he's kind of hypocritical. To claim that he loves the Cowboys so much, but really, no evidence at all. And today, we continue in our series looking at R-E-A-L, 
Because our goal this year is that each one of us would take a real next step toward being a disciple of Jesus as a follower of Christ. And and E, as you can see, means esteeming God above all. R was reproducing other disciples. We spent a couple of weeks looking at that. We're looking at esteeming God above all. We'll look at it again next week. And then A, announcing the good news, L, living for others. And so when we think about esteeming God above all, like we're, we're trying to ask a question, well, what is the meaning of esteeming? What does that really look like? And the passage we're going to look at today is Mark chapter 12. I want to ask you to turn there with me right now. Hope you have your Bible with you. We have some extra ones out in the entryway, or if you have a smartphone or some device, just, just uh, find the passage. Look at Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. This is the passage that's going to help us try to make sense out of the meaning of esteeming when we think about esteeming God above all. And uh, basically, our goal this year is, as I said, is that as a family of believers, that each one of us would take a real next step as a follower of Christ. And so we're, we're as Rachel said, we're, we're trying to keep it real this year. And so uh, with that in mind, and you found Mark chapter 12, I'm going to read this. And, and just quickly, kind of the context here is this is a point in time where several of the Pharisees and the scribes have been Uh, approaching Jesus and trying to trap him by asking questions that may kind of get him in an uncomfortable position where he's having to take a position that would, that would, uh, uh, you know, uh, make him look bad in front of the crowd or make him compromise his convictions. And, And several of them have done this. And then there's one who walks up just toward the end of the dialogue that's been taking place, he seems to be a little bit more sincere in his question. But nevertheless, it is a question that's placed to Jesus. In fact, let me just read this for you. This is Mark chapter 12, starting with verse 28. He says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Now, it may help you just to know that the scribes and the Pharisees, like they, they, they figured out that there's well over 600 commands. And uh, about 250 or so were positive commands. And, uh, 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 you know, the balance of them are more negative commands. And like, man, they've got a lot of commands that they're pulling out of this, you know, the Mosaic Covenant and other traditions that they're adding. And so uh, he comes and he's asking the question, which is the most important command? And he may also be asking, which type of command? Because when you look at the law in the Old Testament, you've got the moral law, you've got the ceremonial law, and you have the civil law. And it's like he's asking, okay, what what type of law, what's the most important? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Okay, so uh, Jesus is pretty direct. He kind of quotes out of Deuteronomy. This is famously called the Shema, a word that means hear. Hear, O Israel, Lord our God is one. And, And he quotes out of that, answers the question. And the scribe said to him, you are right. It's always nice to affirm Jesus. You got it right, Jesus. He says, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So uh, in this passage, a couple of things are, are going on, is that basically uh, Jesus is uh, going to give us uh, information about what the, basically the meaning of esteeming God above all. And he's basically saying, hey, the, the real indication of esteeming God above all is that you loved him, that you love God in, in every kind of way. And he's going to talk to us, well, what's the essence of love? What, what, what is that? What's the essence of love? And what is the extent? Like, how much do I love God? And then he's going to talk about what's the evidence? Like, how do you really know if you're loving God? What what evidence would point to that? And then finally, there's an error that we have to avoid about loving God that we'll see at the very end of the passage. So first of all, regarding the essence of God's love, uh, let me just direct your attention back to the idea that when when he asked, what is the, the greatest commandment? You know, what is the most important commandment? He's he's asking really uh, something 
about the, the utmost importance. This is why I'm using this idea of the essence of love. It, it, it is the idea of loving God first. And when you use the idea of loving God first, you can think in two possible ways. It's first in importance, and it's first in order. It's first in importance, and it's first in order. Uh, uh, this word had kind of that idea. It was, it was the idea of that, what's kind of the top? What's kind of the top thing that you love first? And then what is the foundational thing? That what, what's the, the order is important because, you know, if you want to love people, the order here suggests the idea that it begins with loving God, that you love God, and then flowing from that is loving people. And so we get here from a, 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 th- these first few verses, just this idea of, of uh, uh, loving God is the idea of top priority. In fact, the takeaway would be simply that, that we esteem God by loving him as our top priority, as our top priority. Now, I think most of us get the idea of loving God first. You know, you think of uh, seek, uh, you know, seek God, his kingdom with all, uh, and his kingdom and all of his righteousness first. And then he adds these things to you, Matthew 6, 33. You may think about Revelation, you know, where uh, the church is told, hey, you've lost your first love. Go back and do those things from the beginning. This is the idea of love the way you did at the beginning. Love, you know, love God first. But this second idea that to, to, to love God as a primary, first as primary. This is the idea that apart from loving God first, making him top, that you can't really love well outside of that. This is the idea of loving God uh, in, in a way where through him, through your love for him, you're able to love everybody else. In fact, what's interesting is this is kind of helps you make sense out of a very troubling verse found in Luke chapter 14. And there Jesus says in verse 26, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, you know, we want to recoil from that. It's like, how in the world? Like, what does that mean? And what Jesus is saying is that if we love anyone primary in place of Jesus, like Jesus is secondary, tertiary, or whatever, like, but primary, we love these other people. Jesus says, you're always going to get it wrong. Jesus says, you love Jesus primarily first, and then Jesus helps you love. In fact, I think C.S. Lewis captures uh, exactly what Jesus is saying here. He writes, uh, When I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. Insofar as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God or instead of God, I shall be moving towards the state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, Second, things are not suppressed, but increased. In other words, by loving God primarily, by loving Jesus first, you actually will be better at loving your spouse, your children, your friends, your world. Not the other way around. And so Jesus says, first of all, this idea of esteeming God is loving God is top priority. That's the first idea here. And then he's going to move kind of beyond this essence idea and talk about, well, how much do you love? Like, you know, you know, the idea, kind of, you know, you like Jesus. You know, you'd friend him on your Facebook. Uh, is it that you, you know, you, you know you're, you're pro-Jesus. You don't have anything against him. Uh, is it, you know, how much do you love God? And here Jesus spends quite a bit of time, doesn't he? Uh, just to read again. Jesus says, uh, here is the Lord's one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Uh, Basically, Jesus says, you know, just first appearance, is that you love God with all of who you are, both internally, externally. Your whole complete being is fully engaged. That you love him in totality, is what Jesus is saying. But if you were to push a little bit, and if you wanted to try to make some distinctions here, you might say, okay, the heart. You love, love him with all of your heart. The heart was the control seat of the personality. Uh, The heart kind of captured as well this idea of uh, being genuine, of being real, 
uh, you know, we, we use heart that way today. Uh, you know, like, are you, are you wholehearted about this? Or are you half-hearted about this? Uh, we use heart in the sense that, you know, what God really is after is your heart. You know, you may get some things messed up on some of the, you know, like you, maybe you don't know how to pray or, you, you know, you don't know the songs or what. He says, that's not important. What's important is the heart. And so we'll use the heart in that way of being, you know, the real substance of it. Like authenticity is a word that comes to mind. You know, that the heart has that idea of authenticity. Later, it, when the, the, the guy, the scribe, answers back to Jesus, he says, yeah, loving God, loving your neighbor, like that's more than all the burnt offerings. And Jesus would say, yeah, that's exactly right. All the religious ritual stuff can be done kind of externally, but the real issue is the heart. It's the authenticity. And so we love God with all of our heart, authentically. Second is that we love God with all of our soul. The soul was sometimes just translated life. Sometimes the word bios, where we get biology, is used. But this is zoe. This is or, or, uh, sake, is, uh, uh, the word soul. Uh, th- this is the idea of, uh, you know, the, um, more of the affections. This is that which attaches uh, to something that we, we, we really believe we derive life from. It's, it's, it's at that deepest part of us that clings to something, believing that this is what gives life. You know, when we walk around with a shirt that says baseball is life, or, you know, dancing is life, or whatever, you know, that you're into. That we think, okay, here is something that really captures life to the fullest for me. That your soul is kind of deeply connected with that. I, I, would, I would call it the, the affections. A uh, third thing would be the mind. The mind had to do with yeah, kind of the, the disposition, uh, your mindset, it's focused, thinking. It's the idea of like, what, what, are your, what does your mind come back to? You know, when you, when you default, uh, uh, when you're not having to think about something in particular, what does your mind go to? When you lay your head down on the pillow at night, like what, what cap, uh, captivates your thinking and your thoughts? That Jesus is saying, hey, when you love God, when you esteem God above all, and you love him this kind of way with all of your all of your affections, with, with, with all of, you know, authenticity, with, with all of your um, attention. It's the idea just that God has got you. Yeah, that's what you think about. And, uh, you know, all of us can think about times when we've gotten obsessed with something. You know, maybe it was a relationship. Maybe it was a possession. And, you, you, you know, you, you, oh, that's all that you really thought about. Uh, I, you know, I can remember different times in my life, like, where, you know, I, had, I got really fixated on, you know, owning a Jeep. I think I've told you before. Like, I remember one time owning a Jeep was like, uh, it just like I couldn't get my mind out. This is all I wanted. I never got one. Uh, I think the first time I told that story, someone bought me a little toy Jeep. It sits in my, in my office up on. Uh, I'm actually over that obsession now, but I appreciate that little, little token. It reminds me how easily we can throw our obsession and our affections onto something. That would never satisfy the heart of man. But nevertheless, God says, if you want to know what does it mean to really love me, to esteem God of all, it's like, man, you are authentic about it. It's not just motions you're going through. There's authenticity here. There are affections. Your attention is riveted toward that. And then finally, with all your strength, I think simply is just the ability. All of your ability, everything you've got. It's like, don't leave anything out on the field. You know, give it all. This is your ability. It's pretty consuming. It's pretty comprehensive. So when, when you just ask God, what, what does he have in mind for us? What's the greatest command? What's his greatest command to us? It's to love God in this exhausting kind of way that we are completely and, and totally obsessed with him. I would just say to, we esteem God by loving him at total capacity. Total capacity is by every part of us, of who we are. Internal, external is involved in loving him. There was a commercial uh, not too long ago. And uh, in 30 seconds, they, 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 I, I can't remember what the product was they're advertising. But in, in the 30 seconds, you, you, you get the idea that here's a guy who is uh, reluctantly uh, conforming to the custom of his country for an arranged marriage. And uh, he's uh, spent time in America, and so he's kind of gotten away from the custom, so he's not real jazzed about it. But nevertheless, he's... He's conforming, and uh, he's at the airport. He's waiting for his to-be fiancée uh, to arrive. He's never seen her before. 
and he's got uh, some flowers in his hand, and he's reluctantly standing there. And then she comes off the runway, and she's beautiful. And all of a sudden, his whole countenance changes. And then, uh, you know, they have a chance to sit together, and, you know, they're getting to know each other. And, and the more that he's with her and sees her, the more excited he is about this custom. And I think for some of us, we feel like, okay, I know I'm supposed to love God. I'm supposed to really love him. I mean, with all my affection, tension. But man, it just feels like I don't really know him. Because until you see him, until you see how beautiful, Scripture uses the word beautiful, the glorious splendor of his majesty. And one day we will see him face to face, but right now it's the eyes of faith built on what the Bible reveals about him. And the more that you look into his face, the dimmer everything else becomes, the more you love him, the more your countenance changes toward him. It's the idea of seeing him. And God has revealed himself primarily through the word of God and through the people of God as we express his love for each other. That's this idea of loving God with total capacity that really is the result of seeing him, of spending time with him. That's the extent of esteeming God with your total capacity. The third thing is so I would just uh, talk about the evidence. Like, how, how do you know if you're really loving God? Is it because you, you lift your hands in worship? Is it because you sing a little louder than the person next to you? Um, is it because you, you give money or that you serve? Like, like what, what's the real telltale sign that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Well, as you can uh, guess, as Jesus goes on, he says, you love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, first of all, I want you to see the idea of how the, the combination of these two commands. And make sure you catch this. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but you see that Jesus basically says there are no, um, there's no greater commandment, singular, than these, plural. And so Jesus connects these two together. Jesus would basically say, how can you say you love God and hate your brother? In fact, that's what John says in 1 John. He says that this idea, if you love God, you will love your brother. Your relationships will reflect your love for God. And it's so easy for us to think that we really love God, but man, no one in our house feels loved. Nobody at work really feels loved from you. Nobody in your small group actually feels much connection with you. It's so easy to think that we love God so much, but it never finds expression horizontally. But when it does, it is so powerful in terms of its reflection of our love for God. As many of you know that uh, Mike Wozniak had his home going uh, Tuesday evening. And uh, we had the privilege to do a memorial service for him. And many of you were involved in that, I know. We were going to do it here, but there's a such incredible outpouring of love for Mike and Pam and the daughters and, uh, that we had to move it to the Performing Arts Center at Hendrickson High School. There was well over a thousand people there. And I can't tell you how many people that I talked to <laughs> that would just talk about the friendship, that the nature of the friendship, how, how much they were loved by Mike. And we had the, it was just amazing to me. I just could not believe it. But we heard from 
each of Mike's daughters. And then we heard from the lovely Mrs. Wozniak herself. It was such a testimony of people who felt so loved by their husband and their father. And then we heard from friends and colleagues. He was a teacher and coach at Henderson High School, so there were many that were there that I just had a chance to talk to. Him. And one of the great affections of his life is he um, coached a girl's softball as well as volleyball, basketball. But girls' softball was, was kind of done. And they had all this, all the girls' softball team. And, and, uh, and there was, they did this great tribute to him. But one of the things that they would routinely say is that Mike loved me like a father. Such a powerful legacy of love. And let me tell you, that is what Jesus is saying here. That's what characterizes the life of someone who esteems me above all, who loves me with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the kind of relationships they'll have with people. Now, we all have different personalities and all that kind of stuff. I recognize that. But people will feel loved and cared for by those who love God. And how could we ever think (laughs) that we passionately love God and make no connection with people? People at home should feel the most loved by us. And those around us, our church family, our place of business and work, our neighborhoods, people should feel that love. That's the evidence of esteeming God above all. I think you could say it this way, that we esteem God by loving him with tangible ministry. Tangible ministry is just the idea of caring for people, doing for people, wanting God's best for people, interacting with people, serving people. Uh, that, that's what I mean by that. And it's tangible. It's felt. Okay? It's felt by people. That's the evidence of esteeming God. And then I, I want to uh, spend the rest of our time just on what's the most intriguing part to me here on this passage, what I call the error in esteeming God. Because this guy uh, does really well, doesn't he? Uh, he he kind of answers back basically what Jesus says, and he adds on, showing his insight that, yeah, that, that loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, like this is the greatest command. And he, he uh, uh, shows that he understands this by adding to it that this is better than all the burnt offerings, all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, uh, uh, a couple of different places in the Old Testament actually make this point. Uh, God is always trying to correct us to say, we we tend to reduce our faith to God as some kind of ritual, religious kind of stuff. And he's saying, look, that's not what it's about. It's about the heart. And that you can do a lot of religious ritual kind of stuff and never really engage with God at your heart. We all know that. We all know what it's like to come in here on a Sunday morning and your heart is far away from God. And we, we all wrestle with that because you know what? We, we live in a broken world. And we're never going to get it consistently or completely right this side of heaven. And so at times we come in and our heart feels dry. It feels distant. And so we, we come in like, we, we get that. We, 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 we know what that feels like. And so, uh, you know, what Jesus does here is that he's going to both commend this guy and he's going to challenge this guy. First of all, he commends him on the part that he gets right. In fact, he says, you know, you you are wise in what you have said. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he then said to him, so first of all, he commends him on, you know, what he said to get it right. He commends his answer and then he challenges his ability. He says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, on one hand, you're thinking, okay, well, I, wow, all right, well, that's good. I think. Well, is that good? You're not far from the kingdom of God, which is basically to say you're not quite there yet. You're not far. I Man, you got a lot that's right here, but you're not there yet. Now, I would suggest to you that Jesus isn't just using understatement as to say, you're not far from the kingdom of God, meaning, man, you are there. You got it. You're in the kingdom. I would suggest to you that he's saying that this man's understanding is wise and good and right. But I think he's probably trying to touch 
in the man's life the reality that he does not love this way, not consistently, not completely. And let me ask you, who does? Who loves Jesus this perfectly, this consistently, this completely? And like so many of the exchanges that Jesus would often have with different people who would approach him and ask questions about, you know, how do you get eternal life? And, and you know, how, how do you, you know, what's the greatest commandment? All these kind of questions that Jesus would often ask questions to try to touch on their need. Their need for a savior. Because I think what Jesus is saying is that you're thinking correctly, but are you living that out? And nobody apart from God can love God this consistently, this completely, this intently, as what Jesus is saying here. And so I think his statement is basically designed as a challenge to him and, and, and a challenge to me, a challenge to all of us. What do you do with your imperfect love for God? Because today what we celebrate is God's perfect love for those who imperfectly love him. And there are times when your love for God is much more zealous than others. But it all just illustrates the fact that we don't always, all the time, love God the way we know that we should. And what's encouraging to me about this passage is that God loves us. And first of all, that Jesus as our Savior forgives us for our imperfect love. We resonate with a God like Asaph. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 73, who basically said, I was a brute beast before you, God, because I envied the proud and the arrogant. I thought life was was having the life that they want and the riches they had and the health they had and all that kind of stuff. And like my heart went after them until I went into your sanctuary and beheld your glory. And then Asaph repents and he says, whom have I in heaven but you? In being beside you, there's nothing else on earth I desire. Then my heart may grow faint, but you're the strength of my heart. And who of us here has not ever felt the wandering heart? And what Jesus says is he calls us to esteem him above all. But our devotion for him is based on dependence on him. It's Jesus, you're the one who awakens my heart and awakens my soul for you. I think about the lyrics of the song from uh, Soul Fire Revolution, where a singer cries out and says, Awaken my heart, O God, awaken my soul. Then I will wake the dawn with my song. I'll wake the dawn with my song. Awaken my heart, O God, for you. Awaken my soul. And then I will wake the dawn with my song. And I just have to tell you this morning, that's exactly where my heart was. I'm sitting in my office. I'm thinking about preaching this message. And I say, oh, Lord, I don't know if it's just that I'm worn out. But my heart doesn't feel alive to you. Awaken my heart, oh God. Awaken my soul. And then I'll wake the dawn with your song. Have you ever felt that way? I think Jesus wanted this man to get in touch with that. It's not enough just to have the right answers. God calls us to authenticity. That our full affections and attention and with all of our ability that we love him. And that kind of love shows up in the way you relate to people. That's what it means to love God with all your heart. Let's pray. <clears throat> just want you to have a moment to <clears throat> just spend quietly before God. And would you just quietly assess before God, like your heart, where's your heart right now? Do you feel like that uh, there's some distance that's crept in? Do you feel like your heart's going cold? It happens to all of us. But it's especially true if you're here and you've never actually 
placed your faith in Christ, you've, you've never experienced what we talked about last week, what we call conversion, where you basically say, I admit, God, my sin in my life. And I believe, God, that in your love for it, that you sent Jesus to die to pay this penalty for my sin. I believe that. And I want that. And Jesus, I just can't believe that you love me that much, that you would pay for my sin. And I want you to come into my life and be my Savior. And I I want your love to be the, the ruling guide in my life. And if that's your heart's desire, you can just express your faith to God. And it's at that moment that you enter into this forever family of God and can delight in his perfect love for you. Even when our love may not always be perfect toward him. And for the rest of us, as we prepare to respond, just ask God to awaken your heart and your affection for him. Because that's what those who esteem God above all do. We pray in Jesus' name.